One very small site in Greece that has had a tremendous impact on our modern world is the sanctuary of the god Zeus and the goddess Hera at a little place called Olympia. Olympia was named for Mount Olympus in northern Greece where these two gods were located as having their home address in classical times. But its origins go much further back in time to the Bronze Age and the heroic world. And it established a pattern of games as a form of worship that evolved into a quadrennial, a four yearly festival of sports, of athletics, of competitions that were revived in 1896 to become our modern Olympic Games. Present to us in this idea of the games in honor of a god are two very contrasting and conflicting elements of the Greek personality. One is a love and an admiration for agon or contest. Agon is of course the Greek word from which we get agony, striving, struggle, pain. They believed in that as a test of human beings. And they believed that agones, contests, were the true measure of a person, whether a man or at Olympia, where there were also games for young women, a girl. At Olympia, we also see a Greek interest in Panhellenism, all embracing Greekness, inviting all Greeks from all city-states, islands, places of habitation from the Black Sea all the way out to the Western Mediterranean to come back to this central spot tucked away in a remote corner of the Western Peloponnese to take part during a summer once every four years in five days of celebrations and rituals and above all, unless you're an athlete, watching the very best athletes in your world participate in these holy rituals, these games. Now, it would happen months before the, the contest started that the heralds would go out through Greece calling the athletes to come to Olympia for a mandatory period of training before the games. Everyone else followed, all the thousands of spectators, in some cases tens of thousands of spectators, a few months later in midsummer. So let's join that crowd now and make our way to Olympia to have our experience of the original Olympic Games, in many ways so very different from the modern games that they have inspired. As we approach Olympia today, we will come by road, in a car or in a bus, and I really recommend arriving in the afternoon, at a time when you can check into your hotel in the modern little town of Olympia, which has grown up outside the sacred sanctuary and the archaeological site, this modern town, Olympia, being dedicated totally toward the service of tourists and archaeologists. From your hotel, you can then walk through the town to the entrance to the sacred site. It'll be afternoon, the day is starting to get cool, light is starting to get golden, the shadows of the trees, and there are many at Olympia, are beginning to lengthen. As you walk across the bridge over the river Cladeos, one of two rivers at whose convergence the sanctuary of Zeus and Hera was planted by the Greeks. On the other side, you have a choice to go left towards the archaeological museum, which I recommend leaving until the next day, the morning of your second day of staying at Olympia. Instead, go forward a bit till you come to the gates, which mark not only the modern but the ancient entrance to the holy sanctuary of Zeus and Hera at Olympia. Show your tickets, walk in, take a little drink of water, because this may be a hot walk even in the afternoon, and begin to retrace the steps of all those Greek athletes of long ago. Let's talk a little bit about what their experience would have been. They would have fought their way to the top as runners, as track and field stars, as charioteers, even as things like heralds and trumpeters, in order to have this supreme honor of entering that gate as a competitor. We are just coming in in their wake as spectators, people who will derive tremendous joy, unforgettable memories from being here and seeing the best of the best compete once every four years. 
The tradition began, according to the Greeks, way back in the year 776 BC, back in the 8th century, which was also the century of the, the rise of Homer's epics and the rise of the Greek city-state. The Olympic Games were born there too. And the games, held every four years, became such landmarks in the Greek experience, they counted time with them. They will say that such and such a thing occurred in the third year of the 58th Olympiad, or something like that. Ultimately, there were to be almost 300 Olympiads, ending toward the end of the Roman period when the games were closed by the Christian emperors. But we are back in the heyday of the games. We are coming into a sacred place where we find immediately on our left a Prytaneion, a building for the presiding officers of the Olympic Games. Nobody lived at Olympia then. There were two neighboring towns or little city-states, Elis and Pisa, that fought over the right to control the games and one or the other would be in control at any given time. Their officials would be in that little house with the everlasting hearth fire ready to welcome winners and distinguished guests, celebrities from all over the Greek world. But on our right, as we enter, a rather nondescript set of ruins today is something that every athlete, or at least most of the athletes, would have been drawn to as to a magnet, and that is the gymnasium, where some of the track and field stars would practice during the days running up to the games. Within that enormous gymnasium, so big that it's hard for us to recognize as a building, there was a running track which matched the length of the original stadium, the real stadium for the running events, off on the other side of the site, so that athletes could practice on a track that exactly matched the course they would run once they were out in the open before the gaze of up to 40,000 spectators at the event itself. Who would have practiced here in this gymnasium to your right? Well, all the runners. The track within the big stadium was about 630 feet long. So the runners who are either going to run one length of the track or two, they'll turn around a post and come back. So they'd be running something like a 440 yards. Uh, they're going to be practicing there. And also some of the field athletes, the javelin throwers, because that's a, the same place they'll be performing for their hurling of the javelin, and the discus throwers also will be practicing on this long track in the gymnasium. We keep on walking forward, headed south, and we now come to our left a latecomer among the great buildings of Olympia, a circular building, a tholos, from the circular base of which rise beautiful ionic marble columns in a circle, and inside were the portraits of three very important people. Philip II, King of Macedon, in the middle and late part of the 4th century BC, his wife Olympias, Queen of Macedon, and their son Alexander, eventually to become known as Alexander the Great. Why are they here? They are here because of that idea that Olympia was a Panhellenic shrine. The Macedonian rulers were Greek. They spoke Greek. They were descended from Greeks who had gone north to Macedon and set themselves up as a ruling dynasty over Macedonian tribes. But there was some argument about whether they had lost their Greekness by going north. A predecessor of Philip II's in the previous century had won the right to compete in the Olympic Games as a Greek after a, a scrutiny by the city-state that was in charge of the games at that time. Philip II wanted to reassert that claim. We, the kings of Macedon, are Greeks, because he was setting himself up to be recognized as the leader supreme, the king, the commander-in-chief of all Greeks. He wanted to use the Panhellenic tradition at Olympia to create the idea of a Panhellenic political unit with himself, and later his son Alexander, as the head. So you are looking at a beautiful, ionic piece of propaganda here, plunked down right in your path where no visitor can miss it at the very beginning of the special buildings that lead one into the magic world of Olympia. At the same time, as we look to the right, we see another building, very close to that Philippeion, that monument of Philip. It is the Palestra. P-A-L-A-E-S-T-R-A, 
The palestra, not a word that came over to our modern athletic jargon as gymnasium did. The palestra is the place for an important set of athletes to work out. It's a small square open to the sun with colonnades and little changing rooms all around it. The colonnades are a spectacular landmark. Here is where the wrestlers would train. Here's where the boxers would train. Here is where the all-in wrestlers would train, the kickboxers, the pancratias, who could use all methods to try to defeat their opponents, and sometimes the pancration, which means the all-in fighters or the total force fighters, they actually fought to the death. It was a wildly popular event, but a very troubling one to some spectators. They're training here, and uh, someone who's going to participate in the pentathlon the long jumpers will also be in this palestra, away from the runners and the javelin throwers and discus throwers who were in the longer open space of the gymnasium. Beyond that palestra, still on our right, is a building whose function was not immediately understood when German archeologists first started digging at the site back in the 19th century. This building matched in its size the cella, the inner sanctuary of the Temple of Zeus, and it was finally realized this was the workshop in which the great Athenian sculptor Phidias had created what became literally a wonder of the world. The gigantic statue of Zeus made on a wooden core covered with gold and ivory and therefore called Chris Elephantine. Chris for the gold, the Elephantine from the elephants and the ivory that was ultimately put on the official list in the Hellenistic period of the seven wonders of the world. The excavation of this workshop was a tremendous excitement for the archaeologists involved. They found Phidias's tools. They found the molds in which he had formed the drapery for the statue. They found some of the little spatulas that were used to work with gold leaf. They found remains of his uh, his materials, like the, the, uh, the gold and, and ivory chips and bits and pieces of obsidian and other precious substances. And they apparently found even the great man's drinking cup. Because from among the debris of this studio, this workshop, which had been, like the rest of Olympia, covered by successive floodings of the Alpheos and Claudeos rivers, which deposited layer after layer of silt, to cover over the buildings, the ruins. No town was ever built there, so they weren't desecrated and the stones carried away as in so many places. This sealed in this little cup. And the cup had scratched on the bottom the, the two words, Phidias, Amy. I belong to Phidias. In the same way that you might take a cup of styrofoam or plastic at a party and write your name on the bottom so no one else would drink out of it. Phidias worked for years on this statue of Zeus in the middle of the 5th century BC, the very height of the Greek classical and golden age period, with a large team of assistants. He knew he was creating something special. Olympia wasn't a site like Athens or one of the other city-states. It was a Panhellenic place, a spot where all Greeks would come and see his work, and he wanted to create a masterpiece. He built the Zeus in sections. It was carried over from his workshop across the way to the temple, take it in and placed toward the, the western end of the temple so you could view it straight ahead of you as you came into the doors at the far east end and be overwhelmed by this god seated on his throne and robed in solid gold, apparently gleaming with the white ivory for his skin, crowned with some sort of golden diadem. It was sometimes complained as an artistic point that if he tried to stand up this statue, he would have hit his head on the roof. That's how gigantic he was. But everyone accepted him as the ultimate standard of classical art, and it is a tremendous grief to us that in this case, we don't have souvenir examples. There are just a few coins from the time of the Emperor Hadrian where a design that looks like it must be a representation of that seated Zeus from Olympia appeared stamped on one side of the coin. As we exit Phidias' workshop area, and don't be confused by the Christian crosses here and there, part of it was taken over later to be a church in the very early Christian period. As we exit, let's look now more closely at that temple 
Off to our right is the, uh, the building called the Leonidion. This was a hotel for high-class guests. We're not high-class enough to stay there. We're going to just make our way to the temple. And we will find, looming ahead of us, on a high stone podium, the remains of the Temple of Zeus. It's immediately clear it was knocked down by an earthquake. You can see the fallen column drums in stacks, like so many cookies, coming out, column after column, row after row of drums, from the temple on either side. In fact, it looks like it would be a pretty simple job to put them back together. The Greeks have decided not to put them back together, but they have created at one corner of the temple, the northwest corner, a new column to give you a sense of the height, the majesty of the original colonnades that surrounded the Temple of Zeus. There are some times when you are allowed to walk up the steps and cross the, the podium, the, the base of the temple itself. Uh, last time I was there, you couldn't do that. This goes for almost everything that you hear about or read about in a guidebook to Greece. You just never know what access you will have when you make your own trip. So be prepared for some disappointment. I was certainly disappointed last time with a group of students not to be able to walk up the steps and walk through the temple. But take it with good grace. Uh, the archaeological service is trying to do their best to preserve and also to work on some new restorations, so we have to roll with the punches. If we go off to the far end of the Temple of Zeus, this central thing for the Olympic Games, since they were in his honor, I would like you to look for, at the far end, the east end, a triangular column base. This originally held on its top a beautiful and very famous statue called the Winged Victory. The Winged Victory, or Nike, of the Messenians, a people who inhabited the southwestern corner of the Peloponnese, who had been continually downtrodden by the Spartans, but since in the 420s BC they managed to finally combine with the Athenians and beat the Spartans for once, they hired a sculptor to create this winged victory holding a palm in her hand, a foot coming down onto the top of the triangular column as if she was landing from an airplane. Uh, there she stood outside the door where all the Spartan competitors would have to walk by and see her and be reminded, yes, those Messenians did beat us once. This is perhaps the place to talk about what it really meant for the Greeks to be at the Olympic Games. This idea of the agon, the competition and contest that goes on beyond these sacred precincts. I remember going to Olympia once with my professor of Greek history, Professor Donald Kagan of Yale. He sat down on a stone, the rest of us sat down under the olive trees around him, and he lectured to us about the Greek Olympic ideal. It was a Bishop of Pennsylvania, who created the expression of the modern Olympic ideal, which you may have heard so often, that ideal that says, it is not the winning, but the taking part. Nothing could be more alien to the ancient Greek idea of an agon or contest than to say that all it mattered was to take part. The games at Olympia, the other games, the crown games at Nemea to Zeus, at the Isthmus to Poseidon, at Delphi to Apollo, they're all about winning. There are no second and third prizes. There's a winner and there are losers. Winners got to have statues made of their bodies, portraits of their bodies, after they'd won three times at Olympia. Songs were made about them. They were given free dinners for life in the town hall of their hometown. They were considered like gods, and the little winning ribbons were wrapped around their heads like diadems of gods or heroes. They were considered something more than human. But what's the other side of the coin? The losers are considered nothing. They have to crawl home in shame. They creep around their hometowns in alleys, hoping no one will notice them. They are mortified for the rest of their lives that they lost at Olympia. There is an arrogance about the winning. Go to Homer, read his heroes talking to each other, and you will find that you are looking at the origins of our modern tradition of trash talking at athletic events. That's much closer to the ancient Greek ideal than this idea of just taking part is a wonderful enhancement of life. Now, let's go up to a place now very much closer to the heart of the athlete's experience. We are going north now after getting to the east end of the temple, and we are moving to an open space where the plaques will tell you 
In this spot, once sacred to the mother of the gods, the flame is kindled for the modern Olympic torch. There is a little bowl there of reflecting metal or mirror-like material. The sun's rays are caught in that bowl, so without any striking of a match, once it gets hot enough, it bursts into flame and our four-yearly Olympic flame in modern times is born. There's no evidence they had this kind of ritual for the ancient games. Look to the left and you're looking at the Temple of Hera. It's older than the Temple of Zeus. The worship of Hera, the great goddess, preceded that of Zeus here, and the games for the girls and the young women, about which we know next to nothing, were held at Olympia on a regular basis at times when the men were not there celebrating their games in honor of Zeus. This Temple of Hera is a very interesting Doric structure. Every column is different, with big, flat, plate-like capitals. Apparently it was originally wooden way back in about 600 BC when it was created, and the columns were simply replaced as each wooden column rotted and was judged that it needed replacing. So they were made by different sculptors at different times. Gives that temple a wonderful, unique, and uh, very different kind of appearance from the standard clockwork precision of most classical Greek Doric structures. But it's time for us to enter the stadium. We turn our backs now on the Temple of Hera. We go east. If we are spectators, there is some way for us to get up over the great berm of earth that encloses the huge stadium area. If we're competitors, we will see ahead of us a little arched opening that leads into a masonry vault, a vaulted corridor or tunnel leading from the outer sanctuary into the stadium or stadion, that place of what they called 600 feet, laid out by Heracles. He had big feet, about 16 inches for each foot, but it's, as I said today, it's about 630 feet long, where most of the big track and field events were held. The athletes went into this tunnel, and they were standing in something that, until this tunnel was discovered by the archaeologists, nobody believed existed. A true vault, including true arches built by Greeks long before the Romans. So we need to rewrite all the history books and architectural books that are still out there claiming credit for Roman architects as the inventors of the arch and the vault. After their names are called, they would emerge into the brilliant sunshine and take their places for their events. There were five days of competitions. The trumpeters and heralds went first so they could be picked to call the contestants, either by trumpet fanfare or by name, up to the start or the contesting place for their events. Boys dominated the first day, and the next days were given over to things like the pentathlon, the pancration, the chariot races, which were held on a racetrack further out, a much wider expanse, and so on right through until the fourth day when it was prize giving day and all of the winners assembled to receive their crowns of wild olive, Zeus's own wild olive. And as those crowns settled on their heads, they became immortals. They became people whose fame and glory in the minds of the Greeks would never die. The five linked Olympic rings are sometimes claimed to be a symbol taken from the ancient Greek Olympics. That's not true, that's a modern misunderstanding. But I believe that Baron de Coubertin, who in 1896 revived the Olympic tradition with a set of Olympic Games given at Athens and a stadium built on the site of the old Panathenaic Games, I believe that Coubertin was inspired by all of those wreaths, those victor's wreaths or crowns that you see on plaques and on statues having to do with Olympic athletes to make his five rings that represented the five continents of the world drawn together by the Olympic competitions. As I said, the crowd was about 40,000 people. There must have been structures there that are now hidden or gone because we know that in the early 5th century AD, at the time of the, the changeover to Christian emperors, an entire Roman army was sent in to, quote, end quote, destroy the stadium at Olympia. But you can still see, as you walk in, over on the right side, the little area set apart for the high priests and the judges. You can also see the sill, the stone sill on the ground that was the starting line 
for the running races. And you can take your place there, fitting your own toes into those grooves, squatting down, and then, on the word of a friend, taking off for a run, a trot, perhaps a quiet amble, up and back the stadium at Olympia. But I urge you to do it, even if the best you can do is take your walking stick and shuffle along from the beginning to the far end and back. You will have been retracing the steps of people, especially the boys, whom the ancient world thought were the absolute top of human development, the perfection of the sporting instinct and the cult of the body, the people after whom all others should try to pattern themselves, be part of that wonderful procession. The stadium rounds out our tour of the ancient game site. As we come out again through the tunnel, notice some pedestals for statues that are lining your exit. Your penalty for having cheated at Olympia was to pay to have a statue of Zeus made and erected there. You could be mocked and reviled for all time to come. Again, not exactly our idea of the Olympic spirit. It's not enough to have seen the site at Olympia. There are two wonderful museums that I hope you will visit also. One is on the far side of the river. It's the Museum of the History of the Ancient Olympic Games, and it has marvelous things in it, like the plaques from as late as the late 4th century AD, when there had been almost 300 Olympiads that list some of the winners to show that they had achieved this superhuman state as Olympic victors there in the very end of the Olympic tradition, which was going to go out like a light in 393 when the Emperor Theodosius closed Olympia and almost all the other pagan sanctuaries. It's the other museum, though, where I urge you to spend your most time, the main archaeological museum. You will see the great pedimental sculptures that showed a pair of myths, an Athenian myth that showed Theseus, the Athenian hero, beating some centaurs, some half-man, half-horse monsters who'd come down to break up a wedding reception, and the god Apollo is urging him on as Theseus and his friend Perithous restore order out of chaos, and on the other side, a great chariot race. A myth about a contest, the chariot races were very big and very popular at Olympia, in which the young hero Pelops, after whom Peloponnese, island of Pelops is named, managed to beat a local king in a chariot race and claim this great land for his own. You'll also see squares of stone, these are called the metopes from the temple. They show the labors of Heracles. Heracles, of course, associated with Tiryns, the Mycenaean citadel on the other side of the Peloponnese, but Olympia had been the site of one of his labors. He had diverted the rivers, so they ran through the stables, the filthy manure-filled stables of King Augeas, and achieved the seemingly impossible task of cleaning out those stables. He's there too. You see all 12 of his labors represented on the metopes. Elsewhere, you see treasures that were left at Olympia over the ages. In addition to all of the monuments that we passed around the site as we walk through it, you have to realize that buried underground were offerings that ordinary people brought to Olympia and left there in thanks to the gods or in prayer for blessings yet to come. Warriors and generals brought arms and armor to bury under the ground. And the one that always excites me most is the helmet of the great general Miltiades of Athens, the man who masterminded the victory of the Athenians over the Persians at Marathon in 490 BC and who took his own helmet and that of a Persian warrior that he had either killed or captured down to Olympia and offered to Zeus. On the cheek piece of the helmet are inscribed the words, you can make out the letters yourself, Miltiades to the god. You will see many other treasures, ranging from gigantic bronze cauldrons, left there for Zeus and for Hera, to small images of, of girls and women that may have been left by some of the female participants in the games of Hera. But at the end of your trip, you will be led by the pathway through the museum to a special small sanctuary. It's known from a travel book written by the ancient writer Pausanias that a beautiful statue by the great 
Athenian sculptor Praxiteles of the 4th century BC was at Olympia. It was in the temple of Hera, and it showed Hermes, the messenger god, the god of travel and commerce, holding the baby Dionysus, god of wine and intoxication, when he's still a child, before drinking age, in his arm, and he's dangling a bunch of grapes, sort of showing Dionysus what lies ahead. When the archaeologists excavated Olympia, they were astonished to find that the earthen walls of the Temple of Hera had collapsed inward. If the temple had been stone, like the Temple of Zeus, the collapse of those walls, probably in an earthquake, would have shattered everything inside the temple. But this original marble statue of Praxiteles was there. It was buried in the earth, excavated by the archaeologists in the 19th century. And let me tell you, you will never see such a representation of the human body with a polish of marble worthy of Michelangelo's Pietà as that Hermes holding little Dionysus in his arm. Olympia is a place to return to again and again. It is a magical spot. It is a place where you can touch the ancient world yourself by walking or running that course, by imagining yourself working out in that ancient gymnasium or palestra, enjoying the sensation of being yet another pilgrim in an ongoing flow of pilgrims who have come to this site for inspiration, for a vision of the past, and perhaps given that our life is still a contest and we are still seeking perfection in all things, a vision of a future that might yet be.